Welcome to The Truth in This Art. I am your host, Rob Lee, and today I am privileged to be in conversation with my next guest, a community organizer, artist, capoeira practitioner um, from Baltimore by way of Bahia, Brazil, and they're launching a new um, organization that seeks to widen our perception of us and reconnect the African diaspora by leaning into the Baltimore-Bahia connection through events uh, led by its artists and art spaces. The organization is called Ajinchi, and my guest is named Ariel Barbosa. Welcome to the podcast. Yay, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. So, you know, as we, we start off with this, um, this is a little inside baseball because we've we've been educated together for, for a brief yeah. period of time. So, <laughs> we were. so so thank you for, for making the time and coming here on this um it was snowing when we got got in here. It was snowing, and yesterday <laughs> it was 75. We're I, confused. I don't, trust, I don't trust the weather. I don't either. Who's controlling this? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's Cobra. Um, <laughs> for, for you G.I. Joe heads out there. Um, I didn't get that, <laughs> but I'm going to laugh anyway. You, sh- you should look it up. Just look at G.I. Joe <laughs> and weather, and they're going to be like, so we have a weather machine. We'll control the world with it. <laughs> That's literally what happens we'll on do. episodes. As soon as I leave here. So talk about um, your involvement in community organizing or just share a little bit of your background and like some of your interests and like when you kind of got involved in them. Definitely. So I'm definitely in a season where I'm realizing um, this like truer self of mine, being a community organizer, being an artist. Um, I'm uncovering the moments and the times in the past when I have expressed that. But I think right now I'm coming into a fuller version of that. Um, I, my background, I grew up in Towson. Um, not entirely proud of that. <laughs> but mainly because I just didn't um, really resonate entirely with the social space there. Um, I did kind of grow up on the edge in that I grew up between the city and the county um, in Drumcastle Apartments, um, which first stop for a lot of immigrants that um, first come to the U.S. and That's where my dad and my mom settled when my dad came from Bahia, Brazil, and they had met there and came here. Um, And it was a multicultural um, experience um, that did not reflect the rest of Towson. (laughs) Um, And so I did kind of feel um, other or different or um, like I probably had a different kind of view of the world than a lot of my peers who were very um, success driven, a lot went to Ivy Leagues, a lot were um, just a different kind of, I think, privilege. Um, I did have, you know, some incredible friends too and had some great moments, but um, I think I have definitely been on the search to find my community, my Mm -hmm. people. Um, I did find more of that in college. and just found people who were really thinking beyond their context, beyond their bubble that they grew up in, were really going through this process of becoming more conscious and um, were humble and open to learning and surrendering to the process of of taking on so many more other perspectives yeah. to the point where I got to a point where I was like, I don't know what I believe. I don't know anything, um, especially like with my Christian faith to um, this kind of... Uh, this big question mark, um, but through um, some of my travels that I got to do in college too, I got to go to South Africa and India and spent some time with my family in Brazil. Um, Those always kind of made me come alive again and made me really, um, by being kind of on the edges of society again, being with those who are marginalized, um, being in disenfranchised communities, just like split this fire in me every time that I would be in a context like that. And I think living in Baltimore City, um, I feel the contrast of the two worlds. Um, I feel like, once again, I'm able to live in a safer version of Baltimore. I feel like I am... um, I'm... I live in Mount Vernon, and it, it does, you know, I guess. <laughs> Your Towson face. to Mount Vernon, oh my gosh. It's just, just gritty. <laughs> <Stop>. um, <laughs> um, but just recognizing that literally like a three-minute walk across a bridge is just a completely different reality. And um, I think 
my work just always, I always end up coming back to justice. Like I always end up coming back to wanting the same opportunities that I've been given to be extended, at least to be available or accessible or people to be, you know, aware and connected to them. Um, and yeah, so in terms of community organizing, that's, yeah. that's where that comes from. Um, and then I think with art, um, I feel like art is this really incredible way that you can take power, um, yeah. know yourself, have dignity, um, feel, honestly, when I practice art, I feel very connected to the divine. Like, I feel like I'm almost like a vessel, like, you know, you know, there's definitely moments when I get frustrated and where I'm like, ah, I feel stuck in this particular part of a painting or, but when I'm in flow, yeah. And I think just when I'm in flow in general and other activities too, it's just like I feel like I'm able to really, I feel very certain about my next move. I feel like I know my, my hand knows exactly where to go mm. next. And in order to create this kind of like, not to like speak big, but like a masterpiece that I didn't expect that I could have, I don't think a human can really <laughs> yeah, yeah. do, you know? And I think that, um, I think that when you, I think art has that power to do that for people who feel like they're in powerless mm. situations and situations in socioeconomic context where they feel like they don't have control or there's it's hopeless. Like mm. it, it's why would I even speak? No one's going to listen. Why would I even write a petition? The government doesn't care about me. Like, why would I why would I do anything different than right now? Because it's not going to get me to any place different than what I've experienced my whole life because of the oppression of a lot of different forces. So, like, I think when you're able to, like, sit with a piece of yeah. art and really um, fully just let, like, your true self flow through it onto the canvas, like, that is a confidence builder that I think is, um, that's what I'm, I guess, personally what I've narrowed down is like I'm truly passionate about is wanting to do that for myself, but also wanting to be in community um, and and spread that within communities, um, particularly ones in the darkest of places. Yeah. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> so, I mean, also one of the other arts or arts that I think you're connecting with folks is uh, some martial art, right? Yeah. So talk about that a little bit. Okay. So, yeah, I had the opportunity of, um, for the first time, leading people through capoeira in the class that Rob Lee and I were in. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, yeah, so capoeira is this... Um, Brazilian, Afro-Brazilian martial art form um, that's very popular in Bahia, where my family is from. Mm -hmm. And it has some really beautiful roots in history. Um, so during slavery, it was a way of um, training, going off and training um, in private to take over, to revolt. Um, it was disguised as a dance. So anytime that an enslaver would walk by, um, they would toss a woman in and the woman would start shaking her bum and they'd all think, ah, oh, she's just dancing. You know, they're just dancing. It's fine, I guess. And, um, but in reality, they were actually, you know, as soon as that person walked away, they could train again and they could um, prepare themselves for revolt. And it ended up working in a lot of cases in Brazil. Um, Bahia, if you all did not know, was actually a larger slave trade than um, than Baltimore, than the United States. Huh. It's the largest in the world. And so um, to hear, it's really fascinating to me how across the African diaspora, different people groups responded in different ways to slavery. Um, like in Haiti, like complete revolt, like complete burning everything down. Um, in Bahia, it was this playful kind of use of this martial art dance form that allowed them to escape. So the actual movement of capoeira has so many escapes in it. You're always just, you're never touching the other person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but you're ducking, and yeah. you're weaving, and you're just, you're always just trying to um, get to freedom. But it's evolved into more of a connection process, you know, a way to um, learn connection over violence um, and healing through that. Yeah. But historically, it ended up leading to people literally freeing themselves physically. Um, I guess now it would be more like a mental freer. So there, there's there's two things. One is ridiculous. One is um, connected. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to leave with the connected one first and then close with the ridiculous one. Um, the connected one, this sort of, you know, folks within the African diaspora are doing something that 
you know, white people or the colonizers or enslavers, all of that stuff aren't sure of. And they're like, oh, that's nothing. <laughs> it's kind of part of the story I got when going to the Underground Railroad exhibit mm. and how they had this language of conductors. And it's like, oh, they're, they're yes. just the people that work on the train. They're not doing anything. Right. They're telling people like, look, this is when you need to get here. This train is going to get here. Freedom. Yep. And the ridiculous thing is that Bob's Burgers episode with <laughs> I just I just remember the the, the, the practitioner he he just like huh, huh, Perry Perry move huh. and I was like it is definitely a lot of escape you can't it's they're slippery you're, 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 you guys are slippery I can't can't connect you can't touch you I love it definitely just trying to get more and more slippery in my in my in my martial art practice yes. as as one should <laughs> so you know you you mentioned um, you know your art a little bit so I want to talk about that and um, and I want to talk about creativity a bit yeah um, so. You know, could you describe like your your current like art practice, or what have you, and what are some of the feelings you're trying to express through your art? Because I think I think we're we're, we're some feelings people. We, yes, we're feelers. We are. So if you could share a bit of that, definitely. So I'm definitely drawn to the whimsical. Um, I'm drawn to art that feels very soulful and is speaking a message that. Um, was captured succinctly, like in a few words or in a small painting, or um, but has been able to like move people. Um, ultimately, I want I want to move people. That would be you know when I do share, I I really want someone to feel something deeply um, for it to resonate. I want to connect. Um, for me personally, with emotions, I literally have popped up in the middle of the night sometimes. <laughs> I need to pay <laughs> like um, or received a, a a message, a text message that just really, you know, infuriated me. And I'm like, I just pop up and I'm like, all right, we got to get this. We got to get these out. We yeah. have to process these emotions. And it really sometimes just felt like a canvas is the best way to do that. Yeah. And in surprising ways, like there's this one time I popped up from a text message. I went to the canvas and <laughs> well, I was chilling. I actually was chilling for like the first hours playing like this really, you know, very calming music. I was in my little Zen mode, just <laughs> flowing the strokes over the canvas. And then I saw the color red and I picked up that red and I just started smashing it on the canvas and the tears came out and I was like, whoa, this is where it is. Yeah, this yeah. is where it is. This is it. Like, this is why I went to this canvas. Yeah. And it ha I had to go through this first hour of, of chill and I guess just, I don't know, flow or movement in order, probably movement because movement tends to get my emotions out yeah. um, to actually hit what was really going on. It ended up leading to me picking up a bunch of different colors that meant different things, turning them into figures on the on the canvas. It was an abstract piece, but figures started appearing. And then words started coming to mind, so I paused and I started writing words on paper and ripping them off and putting them on the canvas and, like, you know, trapped or frustrated. But then on the absolute flip of that, like, wow, I'm doing this so that I can, like, heal through um, really this – it was with a – it was a – a personal relationship and not yeah. a romantic one, but in my life and to be able to heal through like my actual feelings of, of how this person has made me feel and um, to really work through that. And it felt like it was part of my healing journey was to like, um, to, to express this and really let this all out. So um, yeah, it, especially in the past few months, it has been very important for me in a, in this brighter season of my life, but also one where I'm like really digging into my shadow self and like my little demons and my like my ego and um, it's it's been necessary for the movement of those emotions. I like to let my ego just take the wheel sometimes. <laughs> just like, yeah, do it. Do It'd be it. doing that. It'd be just taking the wheel. I don't even have to let it do that. It's just Robert and little Rob. Just y'all sort it out. Y'all got it. You know? I got the reference. <laughs> see, yeah, see, boom, boom, see, I, see I'm, I want to be at the point where I can reference myself as if I'm, if, if I'm another person. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm already doing this sort of thing where I'm referencing other people. Like, yes, yeah, so I was talking to Adio, right? And it's like saying this. It's like, <laughs> no, you can't, you can't multiple, quote people. We you have can't multiple quote people. selves, you know. We got it. <laughs> I love that you're expressing all of them. That's great. Um, what is the most fun or exciting part of the process? And I think I heard a bit of that there. Yeah. Um, and and I'll, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll share from my vantage point just to, to, to pad, but also because it's always about sharing, right? Yeah. Um, the, the conversation. The conversation is actually the exciting part. The research, it's fine. Mm. Um, I think 
it's it's not administrative, but it is like, you know, when you get into that state, you're like, all right, I got these questions here. I just want to do it right now. Yeah. You know, that's the exciting part of getting to the conversation. And at times I'm editing as I go along to make it feel more like a conversation. I have like sort of a guideline, but I think being actually in the conversation, the art of converse, conversing, mm. that's the most exciting part within this sort of process. Mm. Putting it out there and sharing it, that's cool. But being around and being in community with people, I'm yeah. realizing more and more that that's where the excitement lies for me in this yes. sort of whole overarching thing. Yes, definitely. So, so what is that for you? Yeah, I was just thinking of a moment when... Um, I invited a friend into my apartment and she looked at my painting. She was like, what's that? And I explained, it's an odd one. (laughs) But I explained what was going on, um, that, you know, it was a painting of how there's some, there's a face and there's a mask on the face and there's some hands that are manipulating the mask. um, And then there's some hands that are pulling off the mask and like revealing this gold that's beneath it. And I was like, I feel that way sometimes. And mm. she was like, me too. <laughs> and she said, you know, about halfway through our conversation, we were talking about something totally different. She looked back at it and she was like, wow, I just keep looking at this. Like, I just really resonate with this. Thank you for creating this. And um, yeah, it's those one-on-one moments for me. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it reminds me of the the mask um, iconography and, and, and sort of concept there reminds me of this uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar. That's why I was typing in a second ago. We wear a mask. We wear the mask. Mm. And I just remember like going over that and it really resonated with me in this advanced like writing class. So sort of that terminology that, you know, you have and, and, I'm, and maybe I'm projecting, but this is the way I'm, I'm taking this idea of masks. And I yeah. had a um, recently uh, I had a. Uh, person that makes masks in New mm. Orleans and he's talking about mask and culture. And we we do this sort of public and private thing. Yeah. And you know, people think they know you. Yeah. But they don't. They know a certain like shade of you and they yeah. know a certain color of you. And it's yeah. like, oh, this is the mask I'm wearing here in this sort of environment. It might you know, have a tie connected to it. Mm-hmm. Or this mask is definitely the Doc Martens and the dirty sweatshirt. That's actually kind of the mask <laughs> I'm usually wearing. Um, but somewhere underneath all of those things, it's almost Scooby-Doo-ish. Mm. You're, you're taking off several and you're getting to who's the real person that's right. there. And I think there's something to be said about that and how we connect with people and who we allow to see who we truly are, who we allow to see. Yeah. They may be... The, the 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 veil, yes. the one that you can see through, not the actual like this has got the mask with the armor on there. You got you can't see anything, mm. but the persons that we kind of allow to get to those 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 other levels go deeper and deeper into who we are as an individual. Definitely, oh, that's deep, probably. I'm I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> so from your vantage point, this this is gonna sound so gauche, but I, I heard it from someone, and I was like, I think it's an interesting question. Um, I believe it was in an interview with Ethan Hawke, and he's mm. talking about, like, does human creativity matter? That's a good, yeah. There's a um, video of him yeah, yeah. that my, my girlfriend and I really love. Um, girlfriend as in my friend, who's best friend. Yeah, she references it. She's an artist as well. And, um, yeah, he breaks down human creativity in such a, uh, such a beautiful way. Um, your question was, how, why does human creativity matter? Um, do you think it matters? And you can expound upon it if you like, but do you think it matters? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. I mean, we don't even know what we're able to create until we do it. Um, I'm realizing that I I can have a lot of um, barriers up to actually doing. I definitely tend towards overthinking or anxiety. Mm. And but once I'm actually doing, Mm -hmm. it's invigorating. It's I feel alive. Um, when I pause that doing, I can revert back to overthinking. So if I let a thought creep in that causes me to pause that doing, I am working on checking myself and just going back to doing it, even if I don't know if it's going to work out, even if I don't know if it's going to be the best thing ever meets my expectations. Um, but when I am doing that is freedom, you know, when I'm like, I'm, I'm doing the commitment of creating. I'm doing the commitment of um, practicing capoeira frequently, you know, creating with my body um, and even like cooking, you know, like committing to like being in my kitchen more. And yeah. um, 
and and putting things together, I mean, what comes from it just, again, it just surprises you. It, that's when it feels like it's not from me. It's like I couldn't have, I couldn't have like imagined that. I couldn't have created or come up with this. Yeah. I couldn't have planned this. Kind of how life ends up working out. You have this like grand plan for your life um, or just kind of this idea as to how things are going to, are going to um, line up in a sequence and it, it ends up being disruptive and really re- disrupted in very beautiful, yeah. necessary ways. And yeah, I think a lot, if I could speak just to the creative process, is just a lot of it is just surrendering to mm-hmm. letting go and letting yourself um, fall into it, almost like falling in love. You, um, you know? You, you might find this, this comparison interesting. Sometimes I call it the creative Holy Ghost. Oh, yeah. Just when you just feel something come over you. And I think in that, yeah. di- in that digital storytelling class we were in, um, I was describing this sort of thing, this override thing of dealing with stage fright and all of that stuff. And I just find the anticipation, right, yeah. is the anxiety driven thing. And that's what I'm trying to articulate in that story. But when you're actually doing it, as far as doing the thing, yeah, it's just something else takes over. It's um I don't know if you watch Moon Knight, but it feels like that a little bit. It's okay. like, oh, the other guy is here. <laughs> oh, the, the actual talented person, not the dude that's in the corner. Like, all right, man, can we get to the after this part? Because mm-hmm. I'm better then. And I definitely feel sort of a a release, a yes. chemical release maybe in the body. Most where definitely. You just feel like you're just exhausted afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> a but, good time. But though. definitely that energy was out there and you're not overthinking it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, this is what I'm supposed to be giving to the world, you know? I don't want to put up any barriers with myself to prevent what I'm supposed to be contributing. Yeah. Like, if I feel that way Mm -hmm. when I'm really in it, I'm supposed to be doing it. Yeah. And I want to, by any means necessary, do what I need to do to release myself from (laughs) any barrier that, you know, stands in my way of that. And. Ultimately, I want other pe- people to feel that same way, too, which is why I want to also encourage others to be creative and to do art and just do it, you yeah. know? I also get stuck in the um, having enough skills or having enough training or education or especially with painting. Um, I have more of a background in, like, writing and photography. Yeah. And when I started, I just felt myself being drawn to painters and to painting. And when I started putting brush to canvas, I was like, oh, I'm not qualified for this. <laughs> I did not go to Micah. <laughs> you know, I did not I did not study. I didn't, you know. Um, but I'm actually finding that I'm coming up with the answers as I do it. Mm. Um, I'm, yeah, the answers are within me. More than not, yeah. the answers end up being within me. I want to I want to move into this this question that I have about um this, this project, this idea, this term that came up a couple of times. What is Ajenshi? Yes. So Ajenshi is a um, a project that I've been working on. Um, has definitely come out of my time that I spent immersed in Bahia. Um, it was about a year ago. I was there for two months. Something that I knew I needed to do. Oh, my gosh. I graduated college during COVID, but my plan right after college was to just go to Bahia, the one-way ticket <laughs> and just immerse. I knew I needed to learn the language. I've, you know, grew up only hearing songs and pieces, but I never fully um, absorbed myself into the language. I knew I needed to just like be with my family. Um, they love me so much, and I feel such a strong bond to them um, that like has always transcended language. And I just really felt like I needed to be in their presence more. I needed to be in their reality. Just how they live, um, what everyday life is like. And just for context, I've only really only spent, you know, two weeks at a time there every few years. This was my first time going entirely by myself for an extended period of time. Um, It's like a 26 hour (laughs) travel time. The ticket's like 1500, I had to save up, you know. Um, But it was just a perfect gap in um, between in my career and just decided to just go. Yeah. And what came of that was um, I was connected to a museum there called Acervo de Laje, which is um, embedded in the favelas, the seaside favelas of Bahia. So favelas are like the stacked up houses. Um, they 
are are known for um, unfortunately for a lot of violence, for um, poverty, um, just conditions that can be yeah, just unsafe, but at the same time are also known for their color, for their loud music, for their vibrance. Um, you know, you think of carnival and you think of um, people just dancing in the streets, like soccer balls being kicked across houses and like <laughs> just this uh, very alive um, context. Um, but again, unfortunately, it's it's also it's a it's a it can be a very dark place. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, Servo de Laje is, is rooted in that. It's founded by a man named Jose Eduardo, who is a Ph.D. of the humanities. Um, he has a lot of literature out, um, most of it on, on art for social transformation. Um, and, of course, speaking you know, from earlier, I really resonate with that. Yeah. Um, and I, someone had told me, a mentor of mine had told me, like, you need to meet this man. Like, it's like, I don't know why, but you need to be connected. I don't know what's going to come of it. But um, so, yeah, I, I went. Um, there, there was at the time a, a bit of a language barrier, but I understood the gist of, of what he was sharing and the tour that he gave me of his space, um, him and his wife, Vilma. And um, just, it's just overflowing with this Afro-Brazilian art of like invisible artists yeah. of, the, of the surrounding area. Invisible in that they haven't been given the same spotlight, the same space, the same value as um, the wealthier artists that are shown downtown. Um, and this is a space to truly have a space for them. Yeah. Um, and they have grown into two buildings, so they're expanding. Um, and they also use their space for youth programming. So for um, for young people in the area to be educated on this beauty of art, like the beauty of blackness, the beauty of the power that you have within you, um, your dignity, reading, you know, incredible authors like Paulo Freire, who I also was very inspired by in college. Um, just this idea that you have this agency innate to you, you have mm -hmm. this power innate to you, um, you have this ability to create, even when you form words together, like Paulo Freire focused a lot on the word. Um, he was running literacy programs in Brazil. And a lot of people were illiterate and mm. teaching people the word itself and yeah. allowing them to the freedom to string words together and actually create their voice and write and capture their their culture and their history and spread it like that just has so much power. And especially within this context that can feel very hopeless. And so that's kind of at the core of this, at the heart of this um, is what he's doing. And I. Also, you know, at the core, I had spoken much earlier in the interview just about how I grew up and not fully feeling like I was with my community or really with my people. And that's also in that I always kind of felt like I was between worlds. I was between the U.S. and Bahia, um, not fully of either. Definitely not fully of Bahia because I just did not spend enough, I have not spent enough time there. Um, but now that I've experienced, you know, the time that I spent there, I experienced the museum, I experienced learning the language. So I'm picking up songs and music differently. Yeah. Um, I'm experiencing even ajenchi, like as a word, it's a phrase that as you start learning Portuguese, you realize it's this affectionate, like way of saying like the people yeah. or us. Um, it's very funny how they use it. And I um, also, though, I, I kind of want it to expand our idea of what us is yeah. um, that you know once once I'm starting to express myself more as an Afro-Brazilian in Baltimore um, others who are also of a Afro-descendant background in Baltimore can kind of can resonate yeah. and we can kind of see ourselves as people of color as not just within our individual community but as part of a much greater african diaspora yeah therefore expanding this idea of us um and so yeah that's that's really the premise of what i want to do and i it, dev it definitely will be led by artists and community organizers because i think again they speak to the soul they know how to move people um and that's that's where the most rich connection comes from so Thank you. Um, yeah. it, I, I'm hearing like self-discovery. I'm hearing a broadening of a community. And that's that's wonderful. Um, and so in that, what are some of the, I guess, goals, some of the, the mission, some of the like ultimately 
what is your vision, pie in the sky, a year from now, five years from now? What is your vision? Definitely. Yeah. Um, I recognize, first of all, that a lot of people in Baltimore don't know about the culture of Bahia. Even though it's funny when you're in Bahia, Bahianos, they think that, you know, if they were to come to the U.S., like there's going to be Brazilian food everywhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> they think like, <laughs> um, like, yo, can I get some Bolsonaro? <laughs> you know, that everyone knows about Bahia because yeah. it's so great. <laughs> you know, when you go and you realize like they also have their own entire own world of music. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, some of the most complex rhythms you've ever heard, too. Um, but I, I really, first of all, I just recognize that there's just going to have to be some exposure. Like, I just really, like, first it's going to just be sharing. And yeah. that's going to come out of myself. It's going to be a, a soul searching of, like, what comes from my culture that I want to express here that does not yet exist here so that people can start to feel it, resonate with it, and then join in. Yeah. And, like, the Capoeira community here is just, like, a perfect example of that. Capoeira comes out of Bahia. Um, there's roots in, there's some African practices as well in Angola that were um, similar. Yeah. But here, I mean, the Capoeira community, it's also global, but in, I'm ta talking about, like, D.C. Yeah. No one is Brazilian in the group that I practice with. <laughs> They're not. Yeah, yeah. And but they're all much better than me, and they're teaching me. You know, <laughs> it's like you got to do this in this way. I mean, you're, you're straighten up your posture a little bit. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's not like that. I love that it's transcended. I love yeah. that it's transcended the culture, but the heart of it has still remained. In that, um, they're very true to the language. They only they only sing in Portuguese. Um, they the instruments there's a very specific way of playing them there's a way that the the, the instruments are set up in the hoda which is the circle that you practice in um the movements like everything is very true to speaking back to bahia speaking back to angola yeah. but everyone is able to be in it yeah. and like i that honestly i think that kind of captures the vision is like how to first expose um like, oh, where is the capoeira in Baltimore? There's no capoeira. It's yeah. very frustrating. <laughs> you know, there's capoeira in D.C. and Philly, but um, there's no group. There, There is some. There is some. Yeah. Um, but not a large presence of it. And so I would love to just start to kind of set up programming um, of getting together capoeira groups, um, potentially some drum circles similar to like Malcolm X Park in D.C., how it happens every single Sunday religiously. Yeah. Um, at 5 p.m. and everyone shows up, you know, they bring all their instruments, they bring their kids, the capoeiristas come out, the um, the vendors come out. It's just this, like, community gathering every week. Um, that would be beautiful. Um, and I also, this, um, I want to keep Acerva da Laje as, like, our anchor institution as we do this. Yeah. And that... First of all, they're the soul of our mission. What they're doing is everything I would ever want to do <laughs> in Baltimore. Um, but also I want, you know, they've requested that they need funding because um, yeah. the economy in Brazil is difficult. And so I feel called right now to um, gather U.S. funds, which will go a lot farther in Brazil too, yeah. and get that to them at, as quickly as possible and to continue to help to fund them. Um, so I think a lot of our events will be reaching back to Bahia and to Acerva da Laje as well. Um, and I grand vision would be to have enough um, funding gathered either from my own business venture with this, from grants or from um, donors, that would allow me to almost function as a foundation where I can distribute out yeah. grants to other grassroots organizations similar to Acerva da Laje. Um, in Bahia and in Baltimore as the focus, but also across the African diaspora. Absolutely. That would be so fire. Um, there's so many people that are doing, so so many organizations that are doing so much, they just need a little extra, a little extra funding or investment. Um, and I, yeah, would love to provide that. Um, so yeah, that's, but ultimately, you know, I I also selfishly want to feel community yeah. and like I want to create the community that I've been craving. And um, I think that's where this is going to start is just starting to kind of find my people where you all at. Who <laughs> Brazilian is that? We, <laughs> we, 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 we hear it all the time where uh, um, and, th and thank you for, for sharing because mm -hmm. 
I think it's important, you know, community being part of something, finding your people. And I I think we hear it all the time, whether it's in folks that are in the art space, folks that are in sort of these adjacent art spaces like, hey, open this restaurant because there was no great taco places here. And I wanted to make the thing that I, you know, felt that was missing. So that's that's what I'm hearing. That sort of same sensibility of I don't see it. So maybe I connect with people through pursuing this. Yes, most definitely. You know, so, yeah, I'm, you know, I think that's a really great idea and a great pursuit and uh, more power to you. Thank you. I receive. (laughs) (laughs) So in these final moments here, I want to um, hit you with some rapid fire questions. Okay. And then uh, we'll get to the shameless plugs because, you know, if anything, this podcast is about, it's about shameless plugs. Yes, sir. It's about, it's about, it's, it's, it's about connecting folks. Uh-huh. All right. So here's the first one. And don't overthink them. Okay. Right. <clears throat> Try not All to. right. Uh, coffee or tea? Uh, tea, 100%. I don't like coffee. Boo. I'm not a coffee person. It makes me this weird buzzed. I don't feel myself. It just, mm-hmm. it's overrated. Mm-hmm. Language. <laughs> Language. Tea. We're a very coffee-focused podcast community <laughs> here. Uh, Shout out to Couples Tea on Howard Street. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have a go-to karaoke song? Ooh. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Go ahead and embarrass yourself, because I, I see you covered your face, <laughs> and you turned red. <laughs> it's Fergalicious by Fergie. As well it should be. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know the, the speedy rap part. That's where I really uh-huh. thrive. <laughs> uh-huh. It's very reminiscent of, like, 80s raps. Like, hit him, baby D. <laughs> like, no, literally. You know. <laughs> Every time I come around. <laughs> Suck. Um, bad, bad, bad. <laughs> uh, late nights or early mornings? Late nights. I'm trying to get into early mornings because mm-hmm. you can do so much. I, I think. But definitely naturally late nights. I'm, I'm not late nights anymore. I used to be. Good for you. And it's just like, I don't know, like I find I'm trying to ride this wave of, and it's something you hear in these different pockets of entrepreneurship and yeah. all, mm-hmm. but you get up, if you've fr- broken down your days into like three hour chunks, four hour chunks, what have you, mm. you've already, if you've gotten up, let's say it's six you've gotten three hours of stuff done more than the guy that got up at nine. Facts. So it's about just creating momentum. Yeah. And um, it's a certain cadence, but sometimes if it flows, like this morning, for instance, yeah. it was one of the things that you, you touched on with the with painting. I woke up at 2.30 in the morning and felt compelled to write questions. That's real. I think I just dumped just like yeah. 15 questions there because – you know, it's a thing. We'll, we'll talk about it after my uh, off pod. But, yeah, it's it's a thing. And I think being able to sort of spend that time and figure out how you're going to use your time and, you know, just shifting your focus on what time means. Because this is yep. consistent, you know. Yeah. And it's – but I think it's, it's consistent, but it's also – it's consistent in the sense that you need rest. Yeah. But I think the way that we perceive time culturally, it varies. Yeah. There's some people, like, from a cross-cultural communication standpoint – that is like, yo, I showed up two hours late. It is fine. <laughs> Whereas here, it's like always be going. Baltimore, you know, Maryland, uh, um, U.S. It's always always be going. Always be going. Yeah. There's never enough time. Yeah. This is the last one. This is the most self-serving one, but it's the last one. Favorite Brazilian street food? Because mm. there's one place I used to go to, and I used to get this this friggin' like mm. it's like a fried joint. Mm. Got, oh, is it a cottage? Yeah. with shrimp in it. Uh, no, I didn't do shrimp. They didn't have okay. shrimp there. They, they, I think it was. What was, what was that? Oh, what, did it have cheese in it? It definitely had cheese. I think it had beef in it too. It a little beef okay, in it. It, it looks like a little teardrop. Yes. Okay, I always forget the name of that. I'm not even gonna lie. I, but I it's delicious. Pronou- I, I used to pronounce it as something very inappropriate because <laughs> I didn't know how to say because it's written one way and it says like cocina. I was like, oh, okay, gotcha. Oh, kosh- yeah, cocina. I think with an X in it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, yeah, it's like coxinia, right? And she was like, no. I know it's spelled <laughs> close to that, but that's, I was like, man, I'm from East Baltimore, man. What, what is this Brazilian Portuguese you, you hitting me with? <laughs> what else come with it? Oh, word. And then it's like always a bunch of cakes in there. And I was like, this place is great. <laughs> Coffee was very strong. I was like, a little less on it that, guys. It is strong. I actually, I actually, this is for you. Okay. I drink coffee in Brazil. <laughs> this, this interview is. So, so. Well, Am I even to be trusted? No, you're not. Um. <laughs> I definitely mainly drink milk in it. It's okay. it's like it's like milk with some coffee. My dad calls it dirty milk. He'll make me some dirty milk. 
Okay, I like that actually. Dirty yeah. Mo. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Close to Dirty so, Pop. <laughs> I don't know what that is. That's a that's a reference to an NSYNC song. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Dirty Pop. <laughs> so what's your, what's your street food? What's your street food? <laughs> um, a cottage for sure. It's like classic by by uh, It's um, you get like, it'll be like the name of the mama who makes it. Yeah. Like her a cottage, like and it's just a little stand that you can get like every few blocks. There's one set up, and everyone has their favorite one. And so we have one in our neighborhood that my aunt Viviani really loved, and it's made in dende oil, which is like this like red African oil, Oof. and then they have the shrimp from the sea, and some tomatoes, and it's just heavenly. It's very very good. And then my favorite sweet is a brigadeiro. Of course, which is like this little fudge ball made out of sweetened condensed milk, Mug. and I could pop, I could pop so many of those in one sitting. It's bad. You're teasing. You're teasing. It's so good. I, I came here with mushroom coffee in my system, and <laughs> what? I'll, I'll tell you about that okay. again. And and uh, a cookie. Now I'm hungry. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> So and, and thank you for indulging the rapid fire questions. You're off that hot seat, as it were. Um, and I want to leave it up in the final moments again to thank you for being on the podcast. Mm, my and, pleasure. Yeah, and um, uh, providing that space for you to shamelessly plug anything that you want to plug in these final moments. Social media, website, all that good stuff. The floor is yours. Wonderful. So uh, my Instagram that I use most often is at a dot v dot barbosa. B A R B O S A. I will be posting a lot more of my art and capoeira on there, kind of merging it into, you know, more authentic identity <laughs> as I'm practicing. Um, and then Ajanchi has an Instagram set up that is at A underscore Janchi. So that's G E N T E B more <laughs> underscore Bahia. Um, and we will be sharing all updates as to what is going on with the organization, um, any programming and events that are coming up, any challenges that you can be part of, um, and just for you to get a little more taste of Bahia, but also I want to be featuring Baltimore artists as equally because it is a, a connection and an exchange. So, um, yeah, those are the main things right now. I hope to set up a website soon and other things, um, but all of all you can keep you can keep posted on it on the Instagram. And there you have it, folks. I want to again thank Ariel Barbosa from Ajinche for coming on to the podcast and uh, chopping it up with me and telling me about a bit of her work. And for Ariel, I am Rob Lee saying that there's art, culture, and community. And around your neck of the woods, you just got to look for it. <laughs> <laughs>